Yeah, absolutely. I'm David Joyner. I'm the Associate Director of Student Experience for Georgia Tech's online Master's of Science and Computer Science program. I also teach way too many classes in the program and teach our online undergraduate class uh, as well. By far the number one thing is faculty buy-in. Um, the reason why OMSCS has worked so well has, because, has been because faculty bought into the idea. And not just bought into the idea of, sure, I'll allow it to happen, but actually embraced it embrace what it can do, embrace the experimental nature of it. I think the, one of the biggest reasons why we've been able to make so much progress as fast as we have has been that every individual class runs kind of as its own fiefdom, where the instructor has full authority and can delegate responsibilities and things like that. But that gives them the ability to experiment and to invent things and to build things that are useful only for their class. I've talked to programs that try to have a lot more top-down management and try to just say, you know, the professor's going to generate the content, but then she's going to hand it to us and then we're going to run the class for her. And that doesn't really work. That puts a lot of pressure on you to do things right. And it puts a lot of pressure on the people without the subject matter expertise to do things that need subject matter expertise. And so the faculty buy-in, not just to allow it to happen, but to embrace it and to experiment with it and to be committed to doing it well, is by far... It's, it's such an important factor that's not worth mentioning any other factors, because if you have that, even if everything else goes wrong, it will probably be successful. The reason why programs like these work is because they allow you to retool, re-educate quickly without taking time off work, without moving your family to Atlanta for two years, things like that. That need is only going to expand. Technology advances far too fast for anyone now to go to school for four years. That early phase still has a lot of value because it's where you develop a lot of the metacognitive skills, you develop the self-discipline, you go out on your own, you become your own person. So I think there's still absolutely a role for undergrad education in this, but the role is no longer four years to prepare you for the next 40 years. It's four years to, well, I take that back. It is four years to prepare you for the next 40 years, but what it prepares you for is not just the job, but it prepares you for the fact that you're going to have to come back and take more classes in five years when technology has changed so much. And it gives you the skills to be ready to, to balance those, to be able to jump back into education and to be a lifelong learner. How credentials keep up with that, I think, will be an interesting question because the master's degree has, has power. But we do have students in our program who say, I'm here to take machine learning with Charles Isbell. And right now, your mechanism doesn't let me take machine learning with Charles Isbell unless I enroll in the full program. So I'm going to take machine learning with Charles Isbell, and then I'm going to leave. And I'll be, you know, and they'll be very upfront about that. And we don't know how, do you, do you treat that as a dropout? Not really, because they never intended to go any further in the first place, and they got what they needed. And so I think at some point, we'll have to go towards something that allows for these smaller scoped uh, kind of retoolings. I think we have a model actually that interestingly is a backdoor way of doing that because students come for the OMSCS degree, but after you've graduated, you can continue to take classes as a non-degree seeking student. And so you build in that mechanism of once you've done the OMSCS program, if you want to come back and take the new class we're launching next semester, you can do that. And so you have the mechanism to, to be able to come back and, and keep retooling at a class level as opposed to on a large degree level. I think that the, the thing I've loved about it has been that it, it lets you separate out the different components of teaching. Uh, in a traditional model, the teacher has to do basically everything. You have to be entertaining on stage, you have to write good assignment descriptions, you have to write good rubrics, you have to administer a team of TAs, and those are all very different skills. That's why I think teaching is so, so difficult, because you have to wear so many different hats before even getting into issues of being stern with some students who are falling behind and being accommodating to some students who need help and things like that. You have to be a mentor and a teacher and a coach and a police officer and all these different things at once while also being a compelling presence on stage. Online lets you separate those things out. And so if we have, you know, a class that has a, um, a need for a lot of forum interaction, for example, we can find the, the teaching assistant who she's really good at being responsive on forums and writing good answers. And that can be her entire role because we have 500, 600, 700 students in a class. Just administering the forum can be one person's entire TA role. And so it lets us separate out um, these kind of roles and find the person best for each individual role. Uh, you know, the very rapid adoption of our online Master's of Science and Computer Science program uh, is a good indicator that there was a demand 
out there for this kind of thing. Now you could say the same for MOOCs, but MOOCs kind of went through a cycle. We've continued to grow. Um, we're reaching a stable point uh, where our graduations are finally starting to catch up a little bit to our matriculation. So I think we're approaching a point where we'll cruise at a steady uh, enrollment, but we haven't seen the kind of the blip uh, that I think you see with some other initiatives. And I think that they, the, the important thing is they reach an audience that really needs to be reached, but they reach that audience also with something that has a defensible value. I'm um, actually doing some research right now uh, with my, um, my lab at Georgia Tech on how MOOCs are so varied. You know, you take MOOCs that are just a, a couple of videos and a couple of questions and you get a certificate, and you take some MOOCs that are 10 weeks long and 100 hours of video and real assignments and things like that. They're so varied that the world doesn't know what value to attach to them. Um, with the master's programs and things like that, there is a connection to an existing mechanism for attaching value. And so I think that's where we're seeing those take off, that it's something they've always been interested in, but it also gives them something that you know the value of it. It's a master's degree from Georgia Tech, and that um, attaches the clout necessary to believe you're going to get out of it what you uh, what you want to get out of it. And I think the, the new initiatives around the, uh, the MicroMasters and the Master Track that Coursera is doing kind of build on this idea as well because they say that this has merit because these schools will take it for credit. Even if you don't apply it for credit, the notion that it can be accepted for credit somewhere is valuable. So it kind of brings in some credibility um, by that connection. Yeah, we've got this semester, I believe we have 9,000 students. Um, we have through summer 2,300 graduates. Um, we've had, I, I don't know the number of applications off the top of my head. We've had, um, about, I don't know the number of that off the top of my head either. Uh, I know our cruising retention rate, depending on how you calculate it, is between 60 or 70%. Um, when I calculate it, it's 70% of students who have ever started the program remain in the program. Uh, if you look a little bit further back, it gets a little bit more difficult to calculate because it was younger back then and smaller, but it looks like 60% of students uh, who enrolled two or more years ago either are still in the program or have graduated, which also tells us that the majority of people who drop out drop out very, very early if 75% of the ones who drop out um, are on the early side. Mm -hmm. Tech launched two new uh, degrees, the OMS Analytics Program and the OMS Cybersecurity Program. I think one of our big initiatives now is to see how these programs can build off each other, not just learning the lessons that they learned, um, but if you're an analytics student, but you have an interest in um, computer vision, for example, that you could take the computer vision class just as a one-off kind of thing and share it with them. When you're teaching live, very often you kind of have a, a loose syllabus to start the semester, but then week to week you're coming up with, how am I going to fill the lecture about you know this? I know it's going to be about, you know, some topic, but the, the actual slides, the actual minute to minute, you kind of fill in as you go along. Whereas when you're filming everything online in advance or filming everything and then putting it online in advance, you have to rethink that all at the same time. And so it really forces people to take a step back and find the real structure of their content, which really improves the class for the on-campus um, audience. And it's also given instructors a really great resource to have to use on campus so that instead of making you come to class and spending our time together synchronously with you just listening to me, I can have you listen in advance and we can use the class time to reinforce or to discuss or do you know, more group work, things like that. And so we've had a lot of professors who've used, um, used it in that way. Class. No matter where you are, there's probably someone relatively nearby who's in the same class. And no matter when you're interacting, there's several other people online who are doing it at the same time. And can we start to build smallness back into it, not by saying everyone has to be in this room at 10 a.m. on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, but by saying, here are 10 people who always seem to be working on their work at 9 p.m. on Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Y'all should talk together. Y'all should interact. Y'all should be you know, social. So one thing Jill did this semester was... Um, we crawl introduction threads, or we have introduction threads where students say, "Hi, I'm you know I'm Susan. I live in Milwaukee. Um, I'm taking this other class this semester. I'm seven classes into the program. Here are my hobbies, and uh, professionally I do this." Uh, so Jill now goes through that and actually builds a little model of each student, and then connect tries to connect students to other students in the class with similar interests, similar classes. So she can say things like, "Here are five other people who are in Milwaukee in this class this semester. Maybe you want to form a study group." Or here are two other people who are also taking the same classes um, that you are this semester, maybe you want to be able to chat about how it's so awful that all three of your classes have tests on the same weekend. Um, or here's someone else who also works in finance. So if you want to talk about why 
finance might be applicable to computer vision, here's someone else who is in the same boat as you. So to try and build those connections because we have the scale that they're, they're now there, we just have to find a way to help people in 800 person classes find that three or four other people who will be particularly similar to them. Yeah, so uh, the way it works is that um, on the forum, when they introduce themselves, we say, and if you'd like Jill to help, actually, we haven't called her Jill in the past for this, but if you'd like Ada to help connect you to your classmates, include this tag, hashtag connect me. And if they include that, Ada replies saying, hey, it's nice to meet you. Um, I'm Ada, I'm your AI social TA. Uh, Here are the people I found that might be of interest to you. And just some general stats to also, I have a, a philosophy of peripheral um, connectedness, kind of like a, the legitimate peripheral participation idea, uh, which is just to say, if you're isolated, even if you don't talk to anybody else, it may be useful for you to know, wow, there's 12 other people who work in finance in Milwaukee who are in the class with me. I may never talk to them, but I know I, I have connections there. I belong because there are other people like me in the program. And so she responds with that kind of data that they can use either just feel you know more connected or they actually use to proactively go out and say hey you know ada told me that you're so and so do you want to have a study group you want to chat just on slack sometimes about the class so